This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. OK, morning everyone. I'm James Hopgood and as Poplar told you on, uh, on Tuesday, I'm going to be doing the next 12 lectures on this course, Signals and Communications 2. Um, so hopefully it's going to be fun. And today's lecture is unashamedly going to be uh, an advert, a sales pitch. So on Monday, Poplar gave you an introduction to, to basically what communication theory was. And today I'm going to give you an introduction to the general area of signal processing. And uh, truth be told, in, in, in my opinion, from what I've observed over the past 10 years, uh, a lot of students just haven't come across signal processing before, uh, either at a school level or, or from, from then onwards. You might think you've come across it before, but as to actually what it is, we're going to discuss today. So one of the aspects of, I think, signal processing is that it's often seen as being sort of software development. It's, if you think of signal processing as being an app on a smartphone, then you know, that's quite a limited perspective on what it is. So what I just first need to do is to give you, um, you're going to get two handouts today. And the very first handout is a very dry one. It just gives you information about uh, just a, an overview of a course. So, so just while the handouts go out, I'd describe them. So this is actually handout one, which I'm going to give you halfway through the lecture. Now, what you're going to get in each lecture is a full handout. And so, for example, the handout that's going around, you can see it's got a lot of text in. And that's for you not to rejoin lectures. There's no way you can sort of keep up with it in lectures. But it's there just to, so you can go and read, read it in your own time. So you need to go and put some study time in. However, I'm not going to do lectures by PowerPoint, because that would be deaf by PowerPoint. So from Tuesday onwards, I'm going to be writing stuff on a visualizer. So I'm going to give you basically incomplete handouts, and you have to complete some of the stuff in there. Now, just so you know, that's not, uh, I'm not using lectures as a way of transmitting information uh, and you recording them. It's not there just sort of, just for the sake of doing it. It's, I personally believe from the way I, I was taught and from observations of students over 10 years, that if you engage in the lecture a little bit more, Either we can either interact through questions or just writing a little bit down is a good thing to do. What that means is you'll need to bring a pen and you know, something to write on. So two years ago, I got feedback from a staff student liaison committee where they said, uh, we've been asked to write things down in lectures on bits of paper. This is crazy because apparently in the first year, most of the teaching is on PowerPoint. So uh, be prepared to write some stuff. Now, I am recording the lectures on an experimental lecture capture method. It may or may not work. The technology runs on my laptop. It's 50, you know 60% chance of working. Don't rely on it. That means that I'll put them up. Uh, so if you do miss something in class, you can go and check it on the lecture captures afterwards. However, the lecture capture comes with a, a bit of a proviso. If attendance drops off, immediately I'll stop posting them. Okay? Because I don't believe that watching... I've tried to watch other people's lectures online. It's, it's, it's really boring. I mean, you might think these lectures are boring, but watching them online is worse. You know. And in any case, I'm not going to be lecturing to an empty room. So I'll do it. It's an experiment. So for your benefit, and we'll see how it goes. But let's, uh, let's talk about signal processing today. OK, so the primary aim of a whole course together is to introduce you to um, signals and systems. So I'm going to describe what signals and systems are, and communication systems. Um, the techniques that you're going to learn in this course actually do apply to a variety of, of fields. It's not just, you know, I'm going to put a particular spin on the topic, but it also has applications in other areas, like for mechanic, in mechanics, for analyzing systems, through to control problems, and there's just a variety of applications. Uh, the one that I keep trying to avoid telling you, because I worry that as engineers you just run off to the city, much of the material you're going to learn today, you could apply if you went into the financial world and you, heaven forbid, went into the investment industry, if you wanted to work for hedge fund companies, the way they predict uh, some of the uh, econometrics basically uses a lot of the techniques you would learn in the signals and comms field. Because at the end of the day, it's applied statistics and that has a variety of applications. 
However, I, I, I really don't want to encourage anyone to go off into the financial world, so there are some of the applications. So one of the things about this course, just before we get started, uh, well, certainly for next week, is that it's, it's going to de um, develop a mathematical framework for which to analyse signals and systems. So at the moment, I haven't told you what signals and systems are, so you might be going, well, I don't know what they are. But we're going to use a mathematical framework to develop it. And the course has often had a reputation for being mathematically difficult. And uh, that's because that's what some of my colleagues think. They think, oh, yeah, you know, sort of, uh, James teaches lots of maths, and it's really hard. You know, you don't want to go and do that. Um, you know, so. And it's not actually the case. So one of the myths that I'm going to, dis to get rid of is, is that you don't need hard maths. In fact, it would be possible to teach this course with no maths, but all I'd be doing is telling you stories, and you wouldn't know how to solve any problems. So from the upfront, I'm going to tell you what mathematics you need to know in order to basically do the tutorial questions. And it's mathematics you've done in Maths 1 and also last semester. Um, so, so I've got a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek here, because you, I hope that most of you will go, well, that's just easy maths, and that's the whole point of putting this up. You need to know how to multiply two exponentials. e to the x times e to the y is e to the x plus y. You just need to know that. Uh, you need to be able to manipulate complex numbers and ideally be able to do that in the Cartesian coordinate system and the polar coordinate system. Now, manipulating complex numbers might actually be the one which you probably haven't had as much familiarity as because I don't know how much they teach at school, but it's still stuff really... I think at this point you should know. And I'm not going to shy away from it. I'm going to give you some questions to have a think about. And I know you can answer them. What I need to do is to convince you that you know, that you think you can answer them. Because the biggest barrier is that you'll, I give you a problem and you go, I don't know how you do it. And I want to convince you that uh, you do know how to do it. Um, differentiating a complex exponential, e to the j omega t, for example, or just e to the ax, just being able to differentiate, uh, differentiate that and integrate it. So now, this is a very frustrating integral. Right, okay, just put, wait, wait, have a discussion. Differentiating e to the ax. Okay, an exponential differentiates to itself. If you've got an a in there and you sort of apply the chain rule, you're going to get, you know, sort of a e to the ax. Integrating it is reverse. Now, we, how many of you are comfortable integrating and differentiating e to the ax? Um, so get a show of hands. Okay. Uh, is anyone particularly uncomfortable? Well, I can't really ask a negative question because I don't want to show anyone up. But, but most of you, I imagine, are comfortable doing that. Right. One of the things I would say is that even up to master's level, students in exams just keep messing that up. So I've got a, a, a master's course in statistical signal processing. And when you set an exam question, it's very easy to design a question where you're going to get the target average just because people make silly mistakes. It's unbelievable how many times, even at a master's level, so students who are three or four years uh, above you, make these mistakes. And it's frustrating. If, you, if, you, if all students could get this uh, derivative and integral correct, then the exam average in my course would be huge. Okay, <laughs> and we'll do the devastating thing of scaling down, or we'll leave it, and next year I'll set an even harder question. So practice it, and just make sure it's always correct. So it's not hard maths. The next thing, for actually always getting right, is solving a quadratic equation. ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. What are the roots of that equation? Okay, actually most students tend to get that right. And what we're going to do is see, as we go through the course, is we'll see a lot of problems can be solved by simple geometry. Um, I'll do this in some examples classes. Uh, it's quite often the case that you have to integrate, for example, a trapezium in you know, a straight line. And a very common approach to solving that problem is simply to do the integral, find out the equation of that line, do the integral, sort of churn, churn a lot of maths, and see what happens. Integrating a trapezium is finding the area under a geometric shape. A trapezium is a triangle plus a rectangle. You can find out the area of a rectangle and a triangle without having to do integration. And it's amazing that 
um, basically, you come across, across a lot of calculus in this course, which uh, you can make very, very complicated. And in fact, is much, much simpler than that. So that's basically, on, honestly, that's all the maths you need to know. Uh, when we, at the end of the course, we'll see, I did set in a, a, an exam question last year, which would have required integration by parts. I was very generous to the class, and I gave a formula with the end result. You know, so do that. Now, much of the maths, as we're going to see, is, is going to build upon the Fourier series that you did last semester. So we're going to be building up upon that. So I will revise, revise that part of the course. So um, Popular mentioned which textbooks there are. So he mentioned the ones which are orientated towards the communication side. The notes I'm going to give you are pretty much complete, is what I would say. I Crazily, over the past 10 years, I've ended up pretty much writing my own textbook, which um, is pretty much plagiarized from the 20 other textbooks out there that are relevant. And so you don't really need to go and get any textbooks for my part of the course. But you might be interested in getting some if you enjoy the subject and you want to go on. So in handout zero, the one that I've, I've given out, it lists all these textbooks. And some of them are in the library. I think for some of them, I've given the library code so you can go and have a look at those. Don't go, buying it. Don't go rushing out buying any of them. Um, it's, it's not really worth it until you start feel like you're struggling in some way. The best book I've got on the subject, which I would love to recommend, but don't want to because it's £45. It's a great book. It's a book called by Laffey. In fact, I think there's a third edition. If, uh, it, it describes everything at a very nice pace. It doesn't assume too much that you know. And so if, you, if at any point you can find this book, I think that's a good one. I've shown four books up on there. I wouldn't say any one of them is better than the other. This field has been around for 60, 70 years, maybe longer. Maybe not that much longer. Uh, all of them are good. In fact, it might be good for you to get a book that I haven't quite recommended, because if you can understand a book which is sort of like covers the same area but is written in a different way, then that's a good thing. Finally, as we go through the course, one of the things I want you to be doing, I, I mean, you, you know this already, so the fact that I'm telling you, sort of, just if you think I'm being sort of a bit patronising, then just tell me afterwards and it's fine. One of the things I want you to do is to be incredibly inquisitive. So any time you don't understand something, I, to be honest, just Google it. Just, just go and look on Wikipedia. Because actually, Wikipedia for this subject area is pretty good. I, I'm, I'm going to Wikipedia all the time for research topics, uh, just to get a bit of an idea about something. So have, use these web resources. There's something called MathWorld, which is quite good. Uh, there's something called a Connections Project, which is fantastic in the US. So just to give you an idea about that, um, the Connections Project, someone in the US uh, in this area of signal processing, recognised that there are 50 textbooks out there, and there are probably 10,000 lecturers around the world lecturing signals and communications of this nature. And we're all going away, and we're I'm all writing you know, some posh lecture notes, which I give you. And it's all the same stuff, but of those 10,000, some of the sets must be pretty good, and lots of them must be pretty rubbish. So the idea of Connections was to encourage lecturers to upload their lecture notes, and the students could go on and vote which ones are the best. And then by yeah, mechanism, the best lecture notes you know, would be described on there. So the project hasn't quite worked out like that, but it does mean that lots of people have contributed to this site. So again, if you need to know more on Fourier transforms, whatever, you can go and have a look at this, this uh, web page. I think Googling at first is probably a good, good option. OK, so Wikipedia. Uh, all the material will be on Learn. And there are a couple of, I've tried a bit of social media. There is a Facebook page. Now, uh, I'm not going to post anything which is formal or official or crucial onto the Facebook page. It all goes on to Learn. Anything that is necessary about the course goes on to Learn. But there's a lot of stuff, um, like minor typos. Uh, I don't really want to send an email out each and every time. I spot a typo in a handout. Um, I will give a collection of those periodically, but what I do is I post things like that onto the Facebook page and sort of say, you know, oh, there's a problem with, with that equation. And so but it's just a way of following minor updates. And the other thing I do, as we'll see when we go through today's lecture, is that occasionally I come across videos, YouTube videos, you know, from I, IEEE, whatever. And if they're relevant to this course, I kind of post them. And basically, I don't do many of them, but the point being that I think they're relevant. And if you want to expand your broader knowledge, then they're worth, worth watching. OK, so you can have a look at those. 
Everything that is on these slides is in the handout, so um, that's, that's that. So that was a broad introduction. So let's actually uh, get on to signal processing. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.